So a lot of people like to think of the war on terror with this first graphic right here. You see the big green circle and on the periphery is a small red circle. And a lot of people, let's just say the big green circle is Islam and the red circle are what we'll call the radical Muslims. We have notionally put that there for all planning purposes. I like to say it's, a, it's an assumption, it's a, a conclusory assumption. We made a conclusion at the very beginning of the war that it's a religion that's been hijacked and therefore we have decided that all we have to do is cleave the radicals from the mainstream. Okay, but what if, just what if, the people we are engaged in, they can actually draw on doctrines that are at the, at the center of Islam. But what that could possibly mean, if it's true, is it would mean that the things we say thinking we're cleaving the radicals from the mainstream would actually have the effect of energizing the base. So what am I saying here? Where these two circles are in relation to each other is very important if we're going to get an understanding of the nature of this enemy. More importantly, where that threat doctrine is in relation to the core Islam is an issue of fact. It's an issue of fact that can only be determined by direct, by direct analysis of Islamic law. Why do I say that? I say that because the enemy we fight says they fight jihad according to Islamic law in furtherance of Islamic law. And that is a fact. Now, for people here who might be cringing and saying, well, I don't believe they interpreted Islam right. I'll actually give that to you. Let's just assume for the purpose of this discussion that the enemy we're fighting in the war on terror who's killing us in the name of Islam is actually wrong about the Islam he's killing us because of it. Okay? He's still killing us about an understanding of Islam that even if imperfect or wrong is still one that, uh, that, that comprises his or composes his threat doctrine and he is still using it for the purpose of killing us. By the way, whether or not it is or is not Correct, again, is an issue of fact. Because it is an issue of fact, it becomes an immediate question to be resolved in our threat, threat analysis. In fact, it should be going into what we used to call the doctrinal template, where a factual analysis, an actual looking at Islamic law, actually mapping it to what the terrorists say, and actually seeing if there's a fit or not a fit. Because it could be, on the one hand, they say they fight jihad according to Islamic law and they're wrong, in which case that creates one course of action. They say they're fighting jihad according to Islamic law and they're right. That creates another course of action. And in the middle, you could have any number, number of intervening circumstances or situations. Now, what does that mean? How you fight this enemy largely depends on how, you, how he orients to Islamic law. And it will define the courses of actions that you, you define. So if you don't know what Islamic law is, then you have no capacity to orient all elements, kinetic and non-kinetic, on this threat. And so long as that's true, you are not threat focused. And I think here's the thing. The enemy knows that. The American public increasingly knows that. Are you going to wait for people just to simply tell you they no longer believe you? Do you think maybe we're almost there? Start, start looking at the polling. So, as I go through this briefing and I say something about what we may or may not show to be a fit, remember, at no time do I have to prove this is really Islamic law to demonstrate that our intelligence analysis should have always included it. And any intelligence analysis that doesn't account for it is faux intelligence because that is the explicit basis on which the people killing Americans say they're fighting us. And if you disagree with that, we don't have a reasonable disagreement. You're wrong, okay? You're wrong as a matter of published Islamic law, which will waive because we're basically telling you that we just have to prove that the enemy thinks that when they kill us. But you're also wrong because that's exactly what the enemy says he's doing. He says it every day. If you're gonna say they have taken out of context, I want you to tell me exactly what it is they said that you said they have taken out of context. Because it seems to me that that never got beyond anything of much more than a talking point. So the question I ask oftentimes is I say, listen, you're free to disagree with anything you want to say in my presentations. I'm here to take these questions. But I ask that we maintain some professional standards. I try to, I try to show that the things I'm showing are relevant. They provide evidence of what is happening. A um, burden of proof is being met. So if somebody wants to disagree with what I'm doing, all I ask is they have a professional basis for it. 
on what factual basis are you disagreeing with this? Okay, because someone will say, well, you're looking at that version of Islamic law, but there are a lot of versions of Islamic law. And my answer has been, and I've never failed, it's never not happened, I'll say, well, what version of Islamic law have you read? And you get the deer in the headlight look, like, I've never read any Islamic law. And I said, well, how can you raise the point that there are competing versions of Islamic law if you've never read Islamic law? And therein, therein, therein lies the rub. You get that postmodern answer. The postmodern answer that says that because there are, is no truth, there are no facts. And everything is a matter of interpretation. Therefore, I, the person asking me the question, don't have to prove that there are competing views of Islamic law to argue that it's a matter of interpretation. I just have to postulate that there could be to raise the question. But you see, that's just simply not professional. And the very, basic, the very fact that I could go to school after school, I can brief senior staff after senior staff, and I will get that 100% of the time, should be telling us something, that maybe we have forgotten that facts are important. In fact, the smallest fact by the grubbiest P PFC in the Army defeats the most elegant assumption and assumptions and presuppositions of the most senior military officer. And I'll tell you what, the grubbiest fact of the grubbiest PFC always, always beats the most erudite, most academically sound assumption and presupposition of senior leaders. Facts beat assumptions all the time. And I will argue that when your assumptions are used to suppress facts, that there should be something that would be equivalent in the legal community to obstruction of justice. Facts have their own weight. Assumptions have no weight. And they should never be allowed to compete with facts. More importantly, they shouldn't even be allowed to compete with facts. So, where do we get that? The postmodern narrative. So I think we should really take a look at this, this left Islamist alliance. It seems to be very real. So people say, uh, Steve, what kind of Islamic law do you use? Well, as it happens, I've collected a pretty large library of Islamic law books. And what I'd like to point out for you before you know, going into the basic answer is, back in the Cold War, we would read what the Soviets wanted us to read about what they were doing. But we always knew that what they wrote for us to read was always propaganda. And what we would do is we would look and see what they were actually doing by reading the books they're writing for their own officers. We, if we could collect it, what they were actually training on. We never organized our training or our mission plan on what they wanted us to think. They always, we always oriented our mission on what we saw them doing. Not what they say, but what they do. And that's important because if you decide that you went to Barnes and Noble and bought a book, about Islam, I'm going to tell you what would you think if your neurosurgeon right before he was going to start op operating on you said, you know, I just got a book at Barnes and Noble. You'd be saying, wait a second here doctor, you're supposed to be reading those books I can't even pronounce. So if you're thinking that you want to stand up to discussions in a professional environment based on the Barnes and Noble standard, I would ask you to think about that. And if it is and you're okay with that, can you really wear the mantle professional at all? Okay, why am I saying this? Because for us to make an analysis of what Islam is or is not, I think we should be reading books written about Islam or written about Muslims that was written by Muslims for a Muslim audience. More importantly, I think that those people should be recognized in the Islamic community as people who are qualified or expertized to say that. So I could care less about any book you want to show me that was written by somebody with the last name of Smith or Jones who wanted to explain to you what Islam is. I care about what Professor, let's see, Syed Qutb was writing for Muslims that we could find in almost every Muslim Brotherhood-oriented mosque in Northern Virginia. Okay, that's what I care. I care about, I care about the books that we see are being used for training inside the Islamic community. I care about the books on Islamic law that are written by, Isla by, uh, by Islamic legal experts that are written for the benefit of a Muslim audience. And when you start reading them and you come up to me and you say, well, Steve, uh, you know, uh, if we read those books, we can't get up to this gooey, nice 
can't we all be friends kumbaya Islam? And I'll say, so you're going to revert back to that gooey stuff, right? That's right, because that's not, our, that's not what our mission is. Our mission is to get along. And my answer is, I thought our mission was to win the war. Okay? And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Our, our, our mission is to properly identify the people who represent or constitute threats based on what they're putting out. And if we read that Islamic law, and it cuts decisively in favor of the Muslim Brotherhood's narrative, not the narrative to you, the narrative they're, they're teaching internally. And if, that, if those Islamic law books can be shown to be quoted by Al-Qaeda, and they are, okay, and we can show that there's a tight fit between what Al-Qaeda said, Islamic law said, and what Islamic law says, and there's a tight fit between that and what they did, then your decision not to orient on that is malpractice. And if people die in engagements because of that, the question loomingly is going to start becoming, did they die because of the fortunes of war? Or did they die because the politically correct path to do, to take, was to outsource our understanding of the nature of the threat to third parties and just pray that the, the house doesn't come down on your command, on your watch? <clears throat> so, what version of Islamic law do I use? I use stuff written by Muslims for Muslims for a Muslim audience. So, what am I showing here? The book that we like to use the most, the book I like to use the most is the one called Reliance of the Traveler. We have a series of backup books that one day this gets condemned. But the reason I like it is because it's a single volume. It's a single volume. It has been uh, properly referenced and is deemed authoritative in, in the American community. Uh, Nuha Mim Keller translated it and he wrote the, uh, he wrote the um, um, commentaries. But if we take a look at the very beginning of, of the Reliance of the Traveler, here we see in Arabic and English that it's the International Institute of Islamic Thought that wrote and validated it. But it's not just that. It's Dr. Alwani who said that. And on his letterhead, he says he's not only the president of the International Institute of Islamic Thought, but he is also a member of the Fiqh Academy at Jeddah. Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. So, lightning flash. Connection between Muslim Brotherhood America and Saudi Arabia. Okay? And take a look. He's got a third title under his signature block. President of the Fiqh Council of North America. So, why is that important? Because if it's good enough for the Muslim Brotherhood in America, it's good enough for you. Okay? We don't have to prove it's right. We just have to prove the Muslim Brotherhood trains off of it. And in the event that they get rid of this book and come up with another one, you know, we have a little lag time. You're going to be, and oh, Steve, they, they, they said this is wrong. Just wait, and we'll find out what replaces it. We pretty much already have them, and they're all pretty much ready to go if we have to. They will say the same thing. So here we have it, okay? This has been approved by the Muslim Brotherhood. It was also, in English and Arabic, approved by the, uh, excuse me, the Syrian authorities, and I also believe the um, Jordanians. But I'd like to show you here the other authenticating authority is Al-Azhar. Al-Azhar is the most prestigious school of Islamic learning in the world. You could say it's Princeton, Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, Oxford, Cambridge, ruled it to one times two. If you are someone who ends up being a student at Al-Azhar, you're in the cream of the crop. If you end up rolling over and teaching there, you're in the cream of the cream of the crop. So as you go around mouthing this rhetoric about how these itinerant Salafis are babbling incoherently about extreme Islam, you might want to think about the fact that the original founder of the Muslim of Al Qaeda, Abdul Azam, that he was a graduate of Al Azhar University. You might want to consider that the number two man at Al Qaeda, um, Ayman al Zawari, I do believe his grandfather was rector of Al Azhar University. And then take a look at other Muslim Brotherhood entities who also have prominent status. Why do I say this? Because if you're going to say that imams speaking to the Muslim community have taken their stuff out of context, I think you should at least be required to make a demonstration of proof that that's true. Because I find that even when there's disagreement with what they say, there's never disagreement about the fact that it is what it says. So, what does Al-Azhar say? We certify that the above-mentioned translation corresponds to the Arabic original and conforms to the practice and faith of the Orthodox Sunni community. There is no objection to printing it or circulating it. So the Muslim Brotherhood is okay with it, and the most prestigious Islamic school of learning is okay with it. So why are you finding it so hard to read this? 
okay? So what does it say about jihad? Well, there it is. Book O, Justice, Section 9. And I like to point out, I show a picture of the book. I show a picture of the first page of the, the, the text, the first page of the book it comes over, Book O, Justice. And I show you Section 9. And what does it say? What does it say the legal definition of jihad is? Jihad means to wage war against non-Muslims and is etymologically derived from the word mahajada, signifying warfare to, to establish the religion, and it is the lesser jihad. It goes on and explains what the spiritual jihad is to make it clear that it is not a part of the legal definition of jihad. So let's take a look at this. This is a page. What does this page say? Well, it seems to be a quote. The stuff underlined in, uh, underlined in green is a, quote from, is a quote from the Quran. And what does it say? He also said that the pinnacle of Islam is jihad in the way of Allah. Allah makes the greatest of works when he says, Do you consider the giving of drink to the pilgrims or the maintenance of the sacred mosque equal to the service of those who believe in Allah and the last day and strive? Please note footnote 113. With might and main in the, in the cause of Allah, they are not equal in the sight of Allah, and Allah guides not those who do wrong. Those who believe and emigrate and strive with might and main in Allah's cause, with their wealth and their lives, have the highest rank in the sight of Allah. Now this radical text is presuming to quote the Quran that says, for the point that Allah says that jihadis take higher priority over other Muslims and who is preferred. So where do you think I got that? Well, first of all, I'd like to point out there's the Quran. That's the page, and that is what it says, and it's Surah 9. Okay, but more importantly, what do we have for 113? The footnote. And what does the footnote say? The word Allah used in Arabic is wajahadafi sabi Allah, meaning may jihad in the path of Allah. It is incorrect to translate the word jihad to mean striving because jihad is a legal terminology with a specific meaning. And that is fighting in the path of Allah and the struggle therein. Translating the word jihad to mean striving is misleading as it gives a meaning different to the intended meaning of the verse. So what are they saying? Yes, you're right. The original meaning of the word jihad is to strive. But what they're telling you is that Islamic law has redefined the term. And the redefinition of the term is warfare. And it's telling you this right here. So not only do we have the reliance of the traveler telling you that that's true, that single book of Islamic law, we have the Tarbiya guide that's used to train 15-year-olds in America. This is the Tarbiya guide and was used for, we, the last instruction we have is July 8th to, to March 2009 and it's put up by Islamic Circle of North America. This was used for training in Chicago. So is a, is a, is a Tarbiya guide used to train Muslims inside mosques in America? Yes. Okay. Does it say that? It does. Do we have to account for that? Yes, we do. If those kids reading this become jihadis and kill us, but it turns out they're wrong, do you get to come back to life? Do all the people who died in World War II at the hands of the Germans come back to life because they were wrong? I'd just like to ask. Let's take a look at this book. Because remember, internationalists who Islamic thought said that that book of Islamic law was okay. Well, look at this. Peace and the Limits of War was written by a man named Louis Safi. Louis Safi wrote this book as a member, as, the, as a senior director, I do believe, of the International Institute of Islamic Thought. Okay, see? Same entity. And what do, how does, how do, so how does Louis Safi define jihad? Well, of course, jihad means to wage war against non-Muslims. Okay? And what does the, 2000, the 1990 explanatory memorandum say? The one that was admitted in evidence in the Holy Land Foundation trial? It says, the Ikhwan, the Muslim Brotherhood, must understand their work in America as a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and Allah's religion is made victorious over all other religions. So that would be the precursor to care. That would be ISNA. That would be the Fiqh Council of North America. That would be the Muslim Student Association. That would be ISNA. I would just like to know, now you know, excuse me, now you know why Congress decided that they didn't want our FBI getting their advice on how to fight the war on terror from people who have this as their doctrine. I think that Congress might have something there. Did you know that that's who those people are? And did you know that that was evidentiary and served into a federal court 
as evidence? If you did, why are you talking to these people? If you didn't, why don't you know? So, what is the founders, what is the motto of the Muslim Brotherhood? Well, not the motto, but what, what, what do we have for the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, Hassan al Banna? It is the nature of Islam to dominate, not to be dominated. Does this sound like a religious statement? I have heard that people in the FBI have been ordered to strike language like this because it's a violation of the First Amendment. I mean, I can't believe that. Oh, you can't say that. You can't put that in your work product. Well, why can't I? It seems, doesn't look like a religious statement to me. It looks like a political statement. It is the nature of ism to dominate, not to be dominated, to oppose its law on all nations and to extend its power to the entire planet. Did I, can I just like redefine what I want to do as a religion and do whatever I want? That's, that's a political statement that should be analyzed politically. So here we take a look at Joint Pub uh, 334 and look at how they look up the word insurgency. How does, how does the Joint Pub define insurgency? The organized use of subversion of violence by a group or movement that seeks to overthrow or force change of a governing authority. It seems to me that we got this definition made. Now think about it. In that explanatory memorandum, the Muslim Brotherhood in America said that they were going to win by our hand. It mean, what they meant by that was they were going to get our seniors to destroy their systems and destroy their way of life and to undermine it. They were going to get their senior militaries to throw their subordinate officers on the track so as not to offend their friends. And now we're seeing that our friends are now not offended because American military officers were thrown onto the tracks. I just think, and by the way, where's the due diligence? Where's the uh, due process? So, <clears throat> if that's the definition of insurgency and the people we're up against say that their mission is a grand jihad and limiting destroying America by our hands, that seems to me to fit that definition. Especially when that group is on record as saying that they define jihad as warfare against non-Muslims to establish the religion. But if that's true, it would also uh, fulfill the requirements of Title 18, Section 2385, advocating the overthrow of the government. That's important, because almost everything coming out of DHS, CRCL, Civil Rights, Civil Liberties, and everything coming out of the FBI lately is, we have our core values. We, we have core values. It seems to me that our core values should be defending this country against those type of insurgencies. It seems to me. Our core values should be looking at section, Title 18, Section 2385 when we look at our friends helping us win the war. So no matter where you get in the circle, that's what comes up. So to develop the threat doctrine, to develop a real threat doctrine, all you really ever need to know and to read are books like this. Okay, how about um, uh, War on Peace and Law of Islam? That was written by a man named Kadori, I think, in the 50s or 60s. How about a seventh grade school book for uh, American Muslim kids? What Islam is all about? How about the Islamic Law of Nations, Shaibani Siyar, the original uh, translation of the original book of Islamic Law of Jihad? How about the Hidayah? How about uh, the, uh, the Distinguished Juris Primer, written by uh, Ishak? All these have been authoritatively translated into English. Why do you think I have it that you can get it on Amazon? The reason I have it so you can see it's on Amazon is because not knowing this is evidence of never even having looked. Not even looking. Okay? So I will tell you who's making the decisions on the war on terror. The people making decisions on the war on terror for the United States of America are the people who gave us the information we're making our decisions on. And you know what we know? We know it's not the people the Constitution gave the authority to do it. Okay? So, to protect and defend against all enemies, you must first undertake a reasonable effort to know all enemies. This enemy is an ongoing solar flare. They say who they are. They are jihadis. It is a fact that they are jihadis. Now, they may be bad jihadis or they may be good jihadis. But if we can't use the word jihad, we can't even read their doctrine. Okay? They say they're fighting jihad according to Islamic law in furtherance of Islamic law. That is a fact. As with the statement on jihad, if you disagree, you're wrong. You were wrong 1,400 years ago. You were wrong on September 10th, 2001. 
you were wrong on September 12, 2001, and you're wrong now, okay? You don't get to decide the facts that define who the enemy is. So, what is Islamic law? Well, I just like to bring this up because people are saying, I read something that they said, Steve Coughlin is making fun of people who don't agree with his understanding of Islam. And I don't care what anybody thinks about my version of Islam. Because I don't care about your version of Islam. I care about the, what Islam is as it's defined by its own doctrinal writings. And I believe that should be the start point. And actually, that's all I've ever argued. So what is Islamic law? Well, it's the law of the land. Let's take a look at a few neutral countries. Here's uh, Doi in his book, Sharia, the Islamic Law. Let me stop here for a second and raise a point. You'll see that the titles of all these books say Islamic Law. And they're being written in countries that recognize Islamic Law as the law of the land. Okay? So even if you personally don't agree that Islamic Law is the law of the land, all we have to do is show that the country you have troops in have put it into their constitution and it becomes a fact that Islamic law is the law of the land and it doesn't matter whether you disagree with it. In fact, your disagreeing with that is counterfactual. It is not true and it matters. Okay? So, moderate, I think, it, uh, Malaysia. What does, uh, what does Doi say? He just recently died. Well, in the moderate Malaysia, he says, in the Sharia, there is an explicit emphasis on the fact that Allah is the lawgiver. It is because of this principle that the Ummah enjoys a derivative rulemaking power and not an absolute law-creating prerogative. You see, democracy is ruled out here. Okay? The entire Muslim Ummah lives under the Sharia to which every member has to submit with sovereignty belonging to Allah alone. Do you see that word Ummah? That's a word the DHS has told us we're not allowed to use. Okay? So, let's take a look at uh, Kamali. I think he's either Malaysian or Indonesian. Malaysian. Okay? And I think, what did he write in his book? The sovereignty in Islam. Sovereignty in Islam is the prerogative of Almighty Allah alone. It is neither the will of the ruler nor of any assembly of men, nor even of the community as a whole that determines the values and laws which uphold those values. The sovereignty of the people, if the use of the word sovereignty is appropriate at all, is a delegated or executive sovereignty only. Okay, so now we have two different books of Islamic law. And you see, it doesn't say the principles of Islamic jurisprudence in the theology of Islam. It says Islamic law, Islamic jurisprudence, Sharia. They're writing law as people who belong to Islamic schools of law for the purpose of it being executed as law. Okay, so Kamali also rules out democratic principles. Here we have Niazi. He, he's a professor in Pakistan. He got his LLM, I think, from Michigan State University or somewhere in Michigan. So he's very familiar. Many of these people are very familiar with our legal system. In fact, they are multiple, multiples more knowledgeable of our legal system than we are of theirs. In fact, most of, our, most of the officers in the AOR, officers in the Middle East from Muslim countries, have an order of magnitude better knowledge of our military because they send their best officers to our schools than we do of theirs. If you want to talk about who has information dominance in this war, it is not us. Remember, we're being told we can't even read their books. And if we do, we have to make up words to say what they are. Okay? Because we're not allowed to say what they said when they said what they were, when they said why they were killing us. We would not get promoted. Islam, it is generally acknowledged, Niazi said in his book, The Methodology of Ijtihad. He says, Islam, is not, Islam, it is generally acknowledged, is a complete way of life, and at the core of this code is the law of Islam. No other sovereign or authority is acceptable to the Muslim unless it guarantees the application of these laws in their entirety. Any other legal system, however attractive it may appear on the surface, is alien for Muslims and is not likely to see, succeed in the solution of the problems it would be doomed from the start. So here's a question before I read on here. Any other legal system, however, wait, unless it guarantees the application of these laws in their entirety. Here's the question. We basically were on the hook for the constitutions in Afghanistan and the constitution of Iraq. Well, if we wrote constitutions that really brought democracy, we would bypass that rule because that rule says that you only have faux democracy because it would yield to Islamic law, or we wrote constitutions that give effect to this language, which means that by any understanding of democracy up until the time we had our war planners try to write 
constitutions in the last 10 years, okay, these constitutions aren't worth the paper they're written on. One of those two will kind of bear out here. A comprehensive, please listen, a comprehensive application of these laws which flow directly or indirectly from the decrees of all law would mean that they should regulate every area of life from politics to private transaction, from criminal justice to the laws of traffic, from ritual to international law, and from the laws of taxation and finance to embezzlement and white collar crime. So here's what I'm getting at. Does that look like theology to you or does that look like law? Okay, if you don't know that that is law, how can you talk about what the Pakistanis are or are not doing? Especially if you ruled out this basis for their legal system that they clearly said was a part of their legal system. And of course, it rejects democracy. So let's take a look at this. This is from a book, Islam of Sacred Law. And what does it say? And since the Sharia is understood as a law with God at its center, all law comes from Allah, it is not possible in principle to limit the Sharia to some aspect of human life and leave out others. It goes on and says, it goes on to deal with the family or personal law, marriage, divorce, paternity, guardianship, and succession and inheritance. Then with the law of contracts, civil wrongs, criminal law, followed by the law of evidence and procedure. It even covers the rules of social etiquette, the Emily Post rules. The Sharia thus covers every field of law, public and private, national and international, together with enormous amounts of material that Westerners would not regard as law at all. Do you think I got this from Egypt? Do you think I got this from Saudi Arabia? No. This is Faisal Rauf, Imam Rauf, the, false, the, uh, the ground zero mosque person. Okay, Islam a sacred law. So, does it matter that when we talk about these people and we know that they wrote books, what language is that? It's English. Every book I showed you was written in English. Okay? People will say, Steve, don't you know that only those who speak classical Arabic can understand the true meaning of Islam? And I'll say, well, I'll buy that. I'll buy that for the same reason I'll buy that only people who speak Russian can understand really what a Soviet op plan means because it loses something in translation. But guess what? We still translated them, and if we got their plans ahead of time, we could still stop them. This idea that there's something so magical about Arabic that it transforms its meanings as it gets translated is silly. It's just silly. It also has basically elevated, when I was an enlisted person, I went to DLI to learn Russian. And you know what? Tr translators were at the bottom of the food chain. In fact, the people who failed out at DLI went on to the school to become analysts. And when you got done doing all your training as a linguist, you had to report to the analyst because he got promoted. Okay? How is it that in every other military situation we're in, we know that translators do not have some a priori or divine inspired knowledge that comes with speaking a foreign language? Okay? Why do we defer? And I mean the higher up we go in the food chain, the more they will defer to somebody who, up until the time they were on their staff, was doing nothing more than driving a taxi, and all of a sudden this person has imparted knowledge that is so different that we have to rely on it. What am I saying? The four biggest countries in the Muslim world do not speak Arabic at all. They've been writing Islamic law in English for a very long time. Is the Arabic preferred? Absolutely it is. But for the, for the uh, what is it, 20%, only 20% of the uh, Muslim world speaks Arabic at all? For the 80% who don't, they can read Islamic law in their language, and I don't, I've never heard anybody say they're less Muslims because of it. Good enough for them, good enough for you. By the way, the four biggest Muslim countries, Indonesia, Pakistan, India, and Malaysia. So let's take a look at this book, What Islam is All About, by Yahi Amrik. This is a book that's used for seventh grade, school, seventh grade kids, seventh grade Muslim kids in America. It is written in English. What is taught there? Well, I always like to start with a quote that, you know, if it was just this, who would care? Okay? <clears throat> Muslims know that Allah is the supreme being in the universe, therefore his laws and commandments must form the basis for all human affairs. We could easily find any number of denominations say the same thing, non-Muslim denominations. And if it was just that, and that's what people are complaining about, we say, get over it. Okay? But it's not just that. Okay? It's also the basis of the legal and political system is the Sharia of Allah. So, Seventh grade kids in America are being told the basis of the legal and political system in the United States is not the Constitution, but the Sharia of Allah. Get ready. That's a fact. 
okay? So, its main sources are the Quran and the Sunnah. Muslims dream of establishing the power of Islam in the world. Finally, let me just give you this quote. The law of the land is the Sharia of Allah. So, what do we know? How many times, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, Steve, just because you can show that it's in Islamic law, that's not what the average person knows. And we say, well, I can't get into what the average person knows, but we can go get the school books that are used for instruction. And the school books used for instruction, and I got this at the bookstore associated with Dar al-Hijra Mosque, says, the law of the land is the Sharia. And by the way, Dar al-Hijra is in Virginia. Okay? That's America. And I will tell you, if you took an oath to protect and defend the Constitution, you took an oath to protect and defend the Constitution because any other legal system declaring its sovereignty in this country. And if you're having a hard time with that, maybe you should go back to your seventh grade civics class. So, let's take a look at some constitutions. Let's take a look at the Iraqi Constitution. Section 1, Article 2. Islam is the official religion of the state and it is a basic source of legislation. Fair enough. But then it goes on and says, no law can be passed that contradicts the undisputed rules of Islam. So what does that mean? Wherever there is Islamic law that is understood and recognized as Islamic law, it will supersede what is ever in the Constitution of Iraq. Okay? So when I was asked to write my analysis of the Iraqi Constitution in 2005 when I was in the Middle East, I said, you stop there. Everything else is just eyewash. Afghanistan. The religion of the state of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan is the sacred religion of Islam. By the way, I'm not complaining that these countries state that Islam is their state religion. We're in the Middle East. The, the prevailing religion is Islam. There's no problem with that. The problem is with a follow-on language that makes a nullity of the democratic aspirations. No law can be contrary to beliefs and provisions of the sacred religion of Islam. So you see, we did exactly what Niazi said in that book from Pakistan, that we made sure that when we wrote those constitutions, there would be nothing in those constitutions that would get in the way of Sharia law. So what do these constitutions do that we wrote? We instituted Sharia law. Think about this. We kept talking about sectarian strife in Iraq. Okay? We said, look at those terrible uh, Shiite, Shiites fighting those terrible Sunnis in this internecine sectarian war. And I had to point out that if you wrote a constitution that subordinates to Islamic law, you wrote, you created the requirement that there be a civil war. Because 40% of the population that is Shia are oriented towards Shia Islamic law. And by the way, there are no ayatollahs in Sunni Islamic law. Okay? And 60% in one way or the other of the rest of the population is Sunni. And they orient on Sunni Islamic law. Okay? So what does it mean? that you wrote a constitution that says it, will, it, it subordinates to a higher power. It means those two players had to fight it out to see who would win. So it turns out that the Saudis were right when they said we're writing a Shiite constitution. Actually, it's really obvious that we did. So, doesn't this mean Al-Qaeda's long-term objectives were met to the exclusion of U.S. objectives in the constitutions we drafted? Doesn't it really what mean that when these were ratified, I think in 2005, the war was over? because the strategic objectives were on the side, were Al-Qaeda's. So let's take a look at some other Arab constitutions. Syria, Article 3, Section 2, Islamic Jurisprudence is the main source of legislation. You may ask, Steve, but they don't follow Islamic law. And I'll say, you may be right. I think that's why, I'll, I think that's why the Muslim Brotherhood says they're in violation of their constitution. Now you'll say, those Muslims are radical because they accuse is Syria of not following their constitution. But I would argue that they're right. From the Egyptian constitution, I have not updated this. This is during the Mubarak period. Islamic jurisprudence is the principal source of legislation, part one, article two. So when, the, uh, when, when, when radical Muslims in Egypt were saying that Egypt is not following the constitution, were they right? Absolutely. So think about this. Everybody has said 10% of the population are extremists. And the 90% are not extremists. What happened is someone drew a normal curve. Okay, they said on one tail are extremists here and extremists here, and they have supporters. Really what they did was they took the normal curve from the Cold War, and they erased right-wing extremists, and they erased left-wing extremists, and they wrote it in, and they said 
That's where extremism comes. And in the middle is moderate Islam. Okay? And at many times I've had to try to explain to people that it's the data points that define the curve, not the curve that defines the data points. Why do I bring this up? Because when they had the uh, um, election, the, um, what do they call it? In, pardon? No, not the parliamentary election, where they just had a sensing of the public in like May, a year ago, or March. Like plebiscite. plebiscite. When they had a plebiscite in Egypt, just like they did with the Palestinians about five years earlier, what happened? 77% of the population voted in favor of the same Islamic law that Al-Qaeda says they're fighting to inst institute. Now, if you take out the fact that about 12% of the population is not Muslim, Coptic Christians, you're close to 90% of the population of Egypt in favor of Sharia law. Now, of course, people will say, well, Steve, half them don't even know what it is. Well, that may be true. Half the people who voted for Hitler probably wish they hadn't soon thereafter. But did they vote for him? They did. Was he brought to power? He did. Am I comparing Hitler to the Muslim Brotherhood? No. I'm just pointing out that did 90% of the Muslim population in Egypt, plus or minus a couple points, vote for Sharia law as understood by Al-Qaeda as their objective? Yes, but if that is true, then they're for the Sharia law that initiates the form of jihad we're fighting, okay? But that also means this. Our 10% are radical is exactly 180 degrees wrong from the election results we have in Egypt, which incidentally mirrored the same election results we saw with Palestine when they put Hamas in charge. What do we hear? Oh, these, there were many reasons to explain this, Steve. And if you give me a year, I'll come up with a whole bunch of them. Because what we're not going to do is ever say that this had something to do with the fact that they were Salafi Muslims running as Salafi Muslims, and that Muslims would vote for Salafis. Because that is not in our war plan. And we will make something up if it kills us. So why don't we know this? There's the duty to lie. This is from Wayne Galthrop's uh, brief. He's the person who's catching a lot of fire. He gave this back to me. I, I saw this brief back in 2004, maybe, somewhere around there. He said, Takiya is a concept based on, how many people here have ever heard of Takiya? Because I actually think, I actually think it's an overused phrase. I think it's, it's it, because Takiya is something that oozes a tactical requirement. Whereas I think there's something more strategic that we're up against. But let's just start with Takiya. Takiya is a concept based on Quran 328 and 16106, as well as Hadith, tasks for literature and judicial commentaries that permit and encourage precautionary dissimulation as a means for hiding true faith in times of persecution or deception when entering the enemy camp. Takiya has been used by Muslims since the 7th century to confuse and split the enemy. One result is the ability to maintain two messages, one to the faithful, while obfuscation and denial is sent and accepted to the non-Muslim audience. I want you to remember that. Because I think what we're going to find, now, it was written before uh, Galthrop wrote this, but it didn't come into evidence until 2008, that this is almost a paraphrase of something we're going to see. Okay? More than just a Shia tradition. So, it has been active, it has been an active element of care from its inception as a Hamas entity organized for disinformation. What right, like? Council on American Islamic Relations. What I'd like to point out here is here's the list of unindicted co-conspirators. And here, number 43, is Omar uh, Yahia. And incidentally, Kerr itself was named as an unindicted co-conspirator. Omar Ahmad was one of the founders of Kerr. Why is this important? There he is right there. Because this is a government exhibit in the Hoy Lam Foundation trial. It's called the Philadelphia, the Philly document, I think it's called, when they bugged a hotel in Philadelphia in 1993. So let me make it clear. The Justice Department used this document to prosecute these people when the FBI bugged a room in 1993 because they knew they were Hamas when Hamas was identified as a terrorist organization. So, what do we have here? Government exhibit. What does Omar Ahmad say? I believe that our problem is that we stop working underground. We will recognize the source of any message which comes out of us. I mean if a message is publicized, we will know. The media person among us will recognize that you send two messages, one to the Americans and one to the Muslims. Seems to me like Galthrop had it exactly right. But more importantly, as they went on and formed the uh, IAP, and then from the IAP they formed CARE, it's, um, 
Islamic Association for Palestine, which was uh, indicted, uh, uh, which is a designated Muslim Brotherhood front group in the whole in the uh, explanatory memorandum. Okay, so what we have here is from the very beginning, and at all times we have known exactly what CARE was. Okay, so much so that the FBI would wiretap that meeting, and the Justice Department, the very Justice Department working with these people, would use that as evidence to throw them into jail. So remember it says first on, uh, based on a couple of Quran verses? Well, here's one, Quran verse 328. What does Quran verse 328 say? Remember, Quran is the word of Allah. Let, uh, let not the believers take the disbelievers as friends instead of believers. And whoever does that will never be helped by Allah in any way, unless indeed you fear a danger from them. And Allah turns you against, and Allah warns you against himself, and to Allah is the final return. So how do we know what that means, and how could that be used to validate takfirism? Well, what we do is we go to what they call taf, taf, tafsirs. Tafsirs are, you could say, uh, explanations for what a verse means in the Quran that have the weight in Islamic law that you could say a note in the, U um, in the US code would have in, in the US code annotated. Okay, There are uh, commentaries that are themselves quoted for their authority in Islamic legal documents. So how does Ibn Kathir, and by the way Ibn Kathir is considered one of the most authoritative, that's why his abridged 10 volume set is available in most mosque bookstores or mosque associated bookstores and what does it say well what does it say it says here, by the way here's the entire explanation from Tasfir Ibn Kathir so you understand I didn't take anything out of context Allah prohibit his believing servants from becoming supporters of the disbelievers or to take them as comrades with whom they develop friendships huh and what is that line unless indeed you fear a danger from them in this case, such believers are allowed to show friendship to the disbelievers outwardly, but never inwardly. Now, I want to point something out. It's going to quote Bukhari. Bukhari is considered the most authoritative Hadith scholar in the Islamic world. His, his, his materials is considered second only to the Quran in authority. Don't believe me? Get the books. It's a, I think it's a four, five, six volume, oh, I think it's eight volume set and read the back cover, it says, second only to the Quran and authority. So if I'm wrong, the book is wrong. By the way, it's published by Dar al Salam out of Saudi Arabia. So what does it say? What does Bukhari say? We smile in the face of some, although our hearts curse them. So this is what they say is one of the Quranic bases for dissimilating against non-Muslims. So let's take a look at modern Islamic law. Remember that book, Reliance of the Traveler? Well, what do we have here? We have Book R, holding one's tongue, and a section called giving a misleading impression, R10.0. So what does it say? It says, scholars, now let me make a point here. When Islamic law refers to scholars, in almost every situation they're talking about authorities, not professors. When they say a scholarly consensus, they don't mean the professors got together they almost always mean mujahids, grand authorities, imams got together. These people are not, strictly speaking, academics. Scholars say there is no harm in giving a misleading impression if required by an interest continence by sacred law. So it seems to me that what we see here is an Islamic legal basis for misrepresenting, if Islamic law will allow it. Now you may be saying, I firmly don't believe that could possibly be true in Islamic law. And my answer is, Am I quoting from a book we qualified as Islamic law? Yes. Are you going to theoretically protest that maybe it's a forgery? I'll give that to you. But if everybody reading that in the Muslim community in America reads it and don't know it's an authority, do they still feel they have a legal right to lie to me or mislead me or mislead you? Yes. So how do you know? First of all, we need to take this into account precisely because it's in play. But secondly, we also need to find out whether we can drive this home. Not because it affects the fact that it's a part of the game, the threat doctrine, but to see what course of action we develop to defeat it. So you will hear me keep coming back to that. Well, let's take a look at section R8, permissible lying. 
First of all, I'd like to point out that it relies on a man named Abu Hamid Ghazali. He's considered the most preeminent jurist in the history of Islamic law by many. And what does he say? Speaking is a means to achieve an objective. So, what else does he say? When it is possible to, to achieve such a name by lying, but not by telling the truth, it is permissible to lie if attaining the goal is permissible, and obligatory to lie if the goal is obligatory. So, the question becomes, are all members of the Muslim Brotherhood required to try to bring Islam to the United States? And the answer is, it's in their mission statement. So, in the Book of Islamic Law that they ratified, for, fit for publishing in America, are they saying that if the only way to do it is to lie to you? Are they obliged to lie to you? By telling the truth. And the answer is, according to this, yes. Okay? Now, it is a fact that that's what that says. And it is wrong to discount that just because it doesn't work for you. So, I like this next phrase because it's one of the few times I've actually read religious strictly speaking, religious considerations in the application of Islamic law. But it is religiously more precautionary in all such cases to employ words that give a misleading impression, meaning to intend by one's words something that is literally true in respect to which one is not lying, while the outward purport of the words deceives the hearer. It's better to deceive than to lie. Excuse me. It's better to mislead than to lie. So. How can we guard against that? Well, I think the first thing we do to guard against it is to know that at any given time, anybody beholden to this book of Islamic law may feel beholden to this rule. Am I calling people who are Muslim liars? No. Do I think Muslims, who, do I think Muslims are liars as a class? No. Do I think the Muslim Brotherhood might believe they're beholden to, beholden to this? Yes. They may well be. Remember, they signed off on this book of Islamic law. So did Al-Azhar. So did the Saudi Arabians, so did the Jordanians, so did the Syrians. So, what, who does this apply to? It applies to anybody who would be the object of an information campaign. If an enemy has concluded that they cannot win a war in the, in the kinetic battle space, then it is, irrational, it is rational for us to conclude they might want to win it in the non-kinetic information battle space. So anybody whose decisions could be turned in the war should understand that they are the object, they are, the, they, they are easily in the zone for people who would be the object of a hostile information campaign. So let's see if we have any other quotes here. Giving directions to someone who wants to do wrong. What does it say here? It is not permissible to give directions and the like to someone intending to perpetrate a sin because it is helping another to commit disobedience. A sin according to Islamic law. So. Who could this apply to? Well, it says, giving directions to wrongdoers includes one, includes one, showing the way to policemen and tyrants when they are going to commit injustice and corruption. Well, it seems to me then, law enforcement should understand that they're a primary object of, of this directive. What's your source, Steve? I just read it to you. Well, just because they shed it, that doesn't mean that's what they mean. I swear if I had a dollar for every time I heard that. So let's put this in practical, let's put this in practical use. Let's go back to the King hearings. Uh, Congressman Peter King pulled out this ad from CARE on their webpage, build a wall of resistance, don't talk to the FBI. Now, some will say, why would CARE tell people not to talk to the FBI? And I would say, oh, it's really simple. It's against Islamic law. How do you know? Oh, I just read it to you. Okay? Steve, it can't be that simple. I said, it's not, that more, it's not, it's not any more difficult than that. Straight line execution or uh, application of the law to the world. Well, why would you think they would do that? Well, because as a Muslim Brotherhood entity, they're committed to implementing and spreading Islamic law. It's in their mission statement. So, simply implementing the law of the land. By the way, I have a number of examples like this. I'm cutting it short here. But when CARE, when CARE tells Muslims to talk, not to talk to the FBI, they are simply giving effect to an Islamic legal standard okay, that the American Muslim Brotherhood seeks to impose. This is the Holy Land Foundation document, the explanatory memorandum, stamped as evidence. 
The general strategic goal of the group in America is, among others, establishing an effective and stable Islamic movement led by the Muslim Brotherhood, which adopts Muslim causes domestically and globally and supports the global Islamic state wherever it is. And that's the Muslim Brotherhood's internationals in their bylaws. Article 2, the Muslim Brotherhood is the international Muslim body which seeks to establish Allah's law on the land. Translated into English, it's the Muslim Brotherhood is the international Muslim body which seeks to establish the law of Islam in the land. What do we need? So here we have the Holy Land Foundation case because it was appealed. And I do believe this is uh, uh, Judge Solis because the Fifth Circuit also upheld this when they appealed again. Finally, Kerr, Nate, and Isna and the, asked the court to strike their names from the public documents fi filed or issued by the government. Um, the government has produced ample evidence to establish the association of Care, Isna, and Nate with the Holy Land Foundation, the Islamic Association for Palestine, and with Hamas. The evidence is, no, is nonetheless sufficient to show the association of these entities with HLF, IAP, and Hamas. So, we're saying that these people have associations with the Muslim Brotherhood, specifically as it relates to this discussion, Hamas, which is a designated terrorist. Now, it's a fact that that's true. It's a fact that a court has upheld that, okay? That is why Congress said, we don't want you talking to them. Why are you talking to them? And why are you talking to them and in the process tossing some officers to the curb on foreign news media? So, there you have it. Do you see how easy this is if we decide to do factual analysis? So what is the, what is the uh, Muslim Brotherhood's motto? Allah is our objective, the Prophet is our leader, the Quran is our law, Jihad is our way, and dying the way of Allah is our highest hope. Okay? Actually, when you think about it, this is not hard and it's not complicated. What's hard is to say you want to understand them by not defining them and then get yourself mixed up in a whole lot of nonsense.